Welcome to the NF2 related schwannomatosis meetup for October. Um, we do have, as always, let me put this in the chat, um, closed captions are available um, and directions for how to get those set up if you're not sure are in the chat, but you just hit that CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen to get those turned on. Um, if you haven't ever seen me here, I am Kate Kelts. I work for CTF uh, and I manage our patient engagement programs as well as the NF registry and planning the NF summit. So I wear a lot of different hats and you'll be seeing a little more of me and my team uh, here at these NF2 meetups. So we're happy to be with you. Um, just a few reminders before we get started with tonight's topic. Uh, please uh, mute your microphone unless you're speaking so that everyone can hear the presenter. Welcome everyone um, in the chat. Please get in there and introduce yourself. Um, say where you're from, what your NF connection is. Uh, you could even include if this is your first meetup or your 25th meetup. We'd love to um, have you guys connect in the chat. Uh, we'll also, we will have a Q&A at the end of our presentation. We have um, a great talk tonight, and then following that, we'll have time for some questions. Then we're going to do kind of a Q&A interview with Dr. Oliver Adunka, and then we'll move into a more open forum discussion. So lots of opportunities to interact tonight. Uh, and when we do have Q&A, if you want to ask a question aloud, please use the raise hand feature so that we know to call on you and um, have you unmute and ask your question. But you're also more than welcome to put questions and comments in the chat and we will um, respond to those as well. So um, and then the last thing I want to say is we're trying something a little new tonight. We're going to be trying a feature in Zoom called the polling feature. You probably have seen it before in other meetings. Um, when you do see a poll pop up on your screen, we'd love for you to respond to those. And then if time allows, we're going to open things up at the end of the evening uh, to go over. I'll, I'll share the results of those polls and we can uh, talk through those as well. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Emily Graves. Emily is the patient engagement manager here at the Children's Tumor Foundation. Um, Emily graduated from the University of North Carolina. She has a diversity of experience across the health sphere, including community-based participatory research at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Her work currently centers on advancing the patient voice and the development of new therapies at CTF, where she also uh, supports the NF registry. So I'm very happy to introduce Emily. Let me get you, let me get you pinned so everybody can see you. All right. Thank you, Kate. And thank you all for having me here today. Um, that was a great introduction into what I'll be talking about, um, which is a subject that's very near and dear to my heart, which is um, patient engagement. Mm -hmm. So we will get started. And just as a reminder, those polls will pop up, you know, fill those out at your own time, and we'll um, discuss that later in the evening. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so I wanted to start here thinking about patient engagement. I'm going to first talk about um, what is patient engagement and where does it come from? Where is it going? And then later talk about what that means for us here at CTF and um, in the NF2 community. I wanted to kind of do this thought exercise first to really imagine how research and I say research, but I mean all um, kind of clinical forwarding of our knowledge about any disease really mm -hmm. comes to be. So first here, I wanted to imagine um, there's a patient and this patient looks like he has a toothache, but you know, this could be any hypothetical disease um, and he's um, suffering from this condition. He goes to his doctor and together the two of them uh, work together to find a treatment course for um, this disease. And let's say um, that maybe there's no direct treatment for this disease that's available yet. So in this case, we have a scientist comes along and hopefully they've been already been doing this, mm -hmm. but the scientists may talk to that patient. They may mm -hmm. um, take a sample from that patient. They may get mm -hmm. some information from them and survey. And that scientist is going to talk to lots of patients and hopefully create what's an effective therapy for that disease. Um, you know, a pharmaceutical company may get involved here. They may spend some money on this project. They may um, help this research go to be they're certainly going to talk to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, which in this states, um, in this country, is really what's going to give that stamp of approval. You know, yes, this is a good drug, or no, this is not. This is a good therapy, or this is not. And all in all, in the end of the day, um, we will get some medication out of this, or um, an intervention that could be um, a surgical device, it could be a uh, gene therapy. This could be lots of things. So this is super, super 
simplified down. Obviously, we know this is a very complicated process and that this is something that takes many years and it's difficult. But I wanted to highlight that this is how we think of research being done. Um, and in this scenario, the patient really only has two points of entry or points um, where they're you know, making a decision that's affecting this change. And I'll note them here. The first of which um, is when that patient participates in research, when they give their information, this could be in a trial or a study, mm -hmm. you know, they could donate, um, like I said, um, a blood sample or something or um, more personal information about themselves and their experience. Mm -hmm. um, and then here at the end, um, when that patient um, um, decides, mm -hmm. you know, all when all this is done and there's a medication on the shelf, you know, do I, is that a good treatment for me? Do I want yeah. to buy this drug, use this drug? Um, or do I, um, do I not, is that not a good decision for me? And I wanted us to think about this because for much of the 20th century, this is how we cure diseases and this is how we, um, created effective therapies. But this, you know, in the scope of how we think about diseases now, um, uh, I think there's a lot of other ways that patients can get involved in this process. And we'll see a couple of examples of that. Um, so now I wanted to just take us to a moment in time, and this is in the 1980s, I would say specifically the mid to late 1980s. And at this point, um, HIV and the disease that causes AIDS is a uh, household name at this time. Um, the epidemic has been happening for a few years now, by the late 80s, and um, all those scientists have actually been studying it and working to find a cure for a long time. Um, there still were no effective treatments by the late 80s. Um, and there's some cool um, stories from this time, although I'll highlight one here, um, a man named Ron Woodruff, who you may know, um, this is him photographed in 1989. He inspired the movie that came out in 2013, the Dallas Buyers Club. And these buyers clubs became popular during this time because patients, um, there weren't you know, effective treatments that they could get prescribed by a doctor and there weren't effective treatments. Um, we'll talk a little bit about why that they could get in a clinical trial. So a lot of them banded together, or many of them banded together in, the, in these instances and pooled resources to get experimental treatments from other countries. Um, in this case, Mexico and Japan were usually where they got these, but um, yeah, um, you'll see why in a second, why this um, created another way that they could get access to therapies that they couldn't before. And I'll add here, this um, photograph is a famous one that's from a protest in 1988. This is when a group called ACT UP, who was very active in this space, um, staged a demonstration at the FDA. They also did similar ones um, at the White House and at the NIH. And chiefly, um, these activists had a few complaints about the clinical trial process. Um, the first of which is that they complained that the FDA and the federal government were actually quite slow in um, um, acting on some of these conditions and that when a drug went into trial, it took um, longer than what many patients had um, in real life to, um, to proceed with this trial. Um, the second complaint that they had was um, the idea of placebos and how they were used. So you might see here in these posters, placebos are mentioned a couple of times. And that was because in this traditional trial design that I mentioned, um, it was common that when you would join the trial, you would um, do that with the um, knowledge that you may get an experimental therapy or you may not, you may get um, like a sugar pill or a placebo. And this was required in us to know, you know, if that therapy worked. But the thing was, is that these placebos, while they were important for the scientific process, they weren't something that um, patients wanted to get because at this point, um, people were very desperate for, um, for care. And this actually discouraged people to participate in these trials, which then, as you can imagine, overall um, slowed down the research process if they couldn't enroll clinical trials. And um, the last, um, big point of contention, and I'll kind of point to this poster back here um, with women with the handprint, is that most of these clinical studies at this time actually excluded women and children um, because that wasn't what they were studying first. And necessarily that, um, as a consequence, meant that these groups um, did not receive care in these um, fields. So um, like I said, these were pretty big complaints um, that these activists came together and said, you know what, this is a new disease. These are new times. The way that we've been doing research isn't working for our community. It's not working for our patients. So they, I think, very um, savvily created these demonstrations and garnered a lot of attention. And importantly, they also hold what they call teach-ins, these weekly educational seminars for their patient community. So that when they would do these protests or when they would talk to scientists or policymakers, 
they would um, you know, know what it meant to be in a clinical trial and know all the names and the fancy scientific words. They would know who was making the decision in the room and who do they need to talk to. And it was a really a great example of um, empowering their members to, you know, those that had no scientific background at all to really get involved in this process. So this was, I don't know, my first for the patient engagement community. Um, and I'll note that they did have some success in these areas. Um, the first of which after this actually exact demonstration, um, the FDA, um, oh, I think a poll just popped up. Um, the FDA announced that um, they were gonna implicate what's called a parallel track, or you may know this now as expanded access. Um, and that these uh, meant that if you didn't qualify for a clinical trial, say you were a woman or you had a, um, a contraindication or you weren't of the right age for a clinical trial, all those things that we think about, um, that you could still access that medication. You just wouldn't participate in the trial. And that you could take that alongside those that were participating in the clinical trial. Um, the second of which is the acceptance of historical controls, which is actually something that you hear a lot more today. Um, even so, um, with NF, we talk about this. And the idea is that instead of having a placebo group, you know, a large placebo group for every time you have a clinical trial that you can look back at other times, the natural histories of a disease, for example, or older clinical trials that you don't need to require people to go on these placebos um, all the way through these trials. And then um, the last point of victory is um, an exciting one that as a result of all of this, these demonstrations, the FDA actually appointed their very first patient representative to sit on any advisory council. This was an, an HIV patient at the time. And um, that was in 93. And then in 96, they actually got voting rights. And we'll talk a little bit later how to this day that is standard practice and how to have patients on some of these advisory councils. So I will move forward a few years, not too far, excuse me, um, to the breast cancer movement um, in the 1990s. And really, um, a group of women saw how effective these tactics were um, with the HIV patient community, and they um, wanted to create something similar, where they wanted to advocate for their specific research needs in their community. And a good woman to talk about this with is Dr. Susan Love, it's pictured right here. She is a surgeon who worked um, early in her career um, in Boston in the 1970s. And she really fell into the breast cancer community because she was one of the few female surgeons at the time in her hospital. Patients liked to come talk to her. She got referred to um, a lot as a breast cancer surgeon. And in her early career, she had a lot of very frank conversations with her patients and found that you know, they weren't entirely happy with their treatment options, whether it was surgery or radiation, that there was um, some, the patient voice was often being left out of these rooms. And, and one of the great examples of this, she, in conversations with both her patients and her experiences in the operating room, really was the forefront of this movement that led um, doctors away from this, what was called a radical mastectomy or a very aggressive surgical intervention towards more targeted procedures like a lumpectomy. And this was because of her interactions with the patients. And I think this is a really wonderful quote that she has here um, in an interview. She talks about how wanting to keep your breast in this case is not about vanity, but it's about being intact as a person. And um, she ended up founding this National Breast Cancer Coalition group um, with a patient in 1991. And they um, founded on this principle that there needs to be more of a patient voice in research and when talking to doctors. Um, one of their first projects was the Project LEAD, which very similar to these teach-ins was a um, place where patients could come to be empowered, to be educated about research. They learned about policy. They learned about the scientific process. Um, and the patient that actually Susan Love co-founded this um, program with spoke to how when she was first diagnosed, she was told by a lot of people in her life, oh, you know, don't worry too much. We'll take care of you. And oh, you know, don't don't think about it. And she would go to these um, support groups at the time that were all about, you know, makeup tips and how to style your wig, which is <laughs> very important. But she, um, in that experience, felt that there was a hunger in this community to be educated and be empowered um, and, and steering the direction of treatments in a way that the patients felt like it. So. These and themselves, I think, were really great success stories from the National Breast Cancer Groups. They're still around today, and they still do Project Lead today. And I think it's a great example of how patients um, early on got into this movement to push people forward. So bringing this into 2000s and today, another um, group that is really 
an early adopter of um, patient engagement was the rare disease community. And this is where NF2 comes in. And as I'm sure you guys know, rare diseases present a lot of unique challenges for therapy development. Um, the first of which is that fewer patients just mean fewer clinical trial participants, fewer study participants. And so um, research moves slower. It's harder to get these large studies that are needed sometimes. Rare diseases are also typically less understood. And so in that case, um, the patient voice is really important because, you know, it could be something that's under researched or the patient perspective isn't well known by um, all scientists that are working on the project. Um, and then thirdly, that um, as you see with these other diseases that we've talked about, clinical trials are often the only way to get an effective treatment for patients. And so it's important that they are designed with the patient um, voice in mind, because that is going to be a big um, part of somebody's experience. So I'll just point out here that um, results from the rare disease group have been, um, I'd say within rare diseases, but also more broadly and about making patient engagement the standard. So you'll see here um, the FDA since the 1980s, and actually this point right here um, is when they included the HIV groups in their decision-making in the 90s. Up until today, they've opened up a lot of more doors to include the patient voice. Um, Pharma has also gotten very interested in this more recently, and I think it's become clear in the science that when you include patients in your decision making as a pharmaceutical company, it actually saves you money. It helps um, drugs get delivered faster, they're better, patients enjoy them more, that there's a lot of um, benefits to this. And another great example of um, the rare disease community really making a difference here is with the Orphan Drug Act in 1983 and the 21st Century Cures Act in 2016 that really pushed the field forward. And this is, I think, a nice cartoon of um, explaining the Orphan Drug Act, but here's um, Orphan Annie and um, the football field that is how difficult it is to get a drug across the finish line and into the end zone. Um, that um, what the Orphan Drug Act did was um, kind of create some pathways for that. So these are all great success stories. And I wanted to kind of frame this history when we talk about what we're doing with patient engagement today. Today, given all these success stories, it's much becoming much more commonly accepted that patients need to be involved in the therapy development process, not just at the end or in the middle or in the beginning, but every step in the way. So I like this graphic to show that while regulators like the FDA and the scientists and clinicians that work on these things are all parts of the puzzle, that patients and families are here really guiding the process and that they're an integral part to this. So today what patient engagement looks like um, is a couple of different things. So I mentioned before priority setting with researchers, sitting down with them and telling them, you know, this symptom is important to me, this may be less so, but this is really what I care about. You know, you should be asking this question or um, people really making sure that um, their perspectives are deriving a lot of this research. Second of which is um, that working on specific studies kind of in a closer capacity, you know, patients might um, review a protocol or as we've seen, review an exclusion criteria and say, you know, this isn't really fit. You know, you have to think about X, Y, and Z when you're creating this trial. Working with study design and study materials are important there. And then I'll show a little bit later, um, speaking at events like FDA listing sessions are also something that um, MCTF has done in the past and that are great opportunities. So um, if you guys are familiar, if you've been around a few years, a few years ago at CTF, we created this program called the Patient Representative Training Program. Essentially, this set out to do a couple things, one of which was to train our patient um, community to be involved in this process, as you saw before. Um, this has um, had really great success. And we also wanted to create a culture of patient centricity here at CTF. What that means is, you know, more inclusion of the patient voice, creating seats at the table in all these different spaces. So we think this went quite well. We trained 25 advocates to participate in projects. And within CTF and within some of the people we work with, we created a lot of space for patients to have more to say in, um, in these spaces. So that being said, why I'm talking to you here today is we are launching a further iteration of this program. We're calling CTF Engage. Um, a few years, we've learned a lot about patient engagement, and we see some new spaces we want to um, reach into. So we have a couple goals with this program, the first of which is the same. We want to train patient representatives to be the best that they can be at these tables to learn the science and to learn the policy and to be able to have conversations with um, scientists and researchers. Um, 
Second of which is we want to work with researchers and we want to you know, make sure that they're including information voice in the spaces. This is something that not only is important to have because it's important, it's important because it creates um, better, uh, faster cures for our community. And that's a big um, priority for ours. So working directly with our researchers and making sure that they're creating space for our patients to be there. Um, the third of which, um, third of these goals is something that's very important to me. And I think this speaks to the fact that um, we know that scientists and the broader community and patients don't always speak the same language, that when you're working with scientific studies, it's complicated, it's challenging, um, and there's a lot of nuance to it. And um, as patient representatives who have gone through a little bit more training, you know, and they have support from us, we really see a potential here for patient reps to be leaders in their own communities and to, um, you know, learn the science and work on these projects and then turn back and be um, ambassadors with other NF patients about what that means and that, how that can affect their life. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but just to quickly run through, this is what we are doing. A couple of things that we're not doing are um, fundraising. There are a lot of really great ways um, to raise money. CTF, this is not one of those. Um, we're not gonna be advocating to Congress or politicians. So we'll be speaking with the FDA, but um, when things that concern you know, political or activism, that's not something that we're doing in this program. Um, and this is not just to reiterate, participating in research oneself. So, you know, the goal is to have our patient representatives at CTF engage, to be working with researchers, to improve studies and to make them the best that they can be. So that when a patient participates in a study or somebody participates in a trial, that that's the best version of that trial. Um, so given that, there's a couple things um, our patient representatives should expect. Um, like I said, the first of which is working directly with researchers. And we're expanding this to both industry or pharmaceutical companies that are doing research, but also what you think of as an academic researcher or somebody that um, works at a university hospital. I went over a couple of those um, areas, but know that these can be short-term commitments or long-term commitments, you know, whatever suits that particular um, representative in that project. Um, other opportunities be working with CTF staff on CTF projects. So things like an event with the FDA, like a listening session. Um, the NF Summit is a great research hub for a patient community that we see our representatives taking a role in um, other various projects. And then to add to that community component, um, promoting the NF registry, as we mentioned, with the idea of um, historical controls or external controls, um, the NF registry is going to play a big role in how we speed up research. I'm in the NF space and we want our patient reps to um, be able to explain this to the community, talk to the community about that. Um, same thing with disseminating important findings. You know, there's some really great research happening and it's hard for patients sometimes to hear about them, to understand what's happening. Um, our patient reps, like I said, will be ambassadors in the sense to our community. Um, and then also kind of broadly sharing your experiences about research to mystifying some of the really important roles here. Um, so that being said, we have an application that is open right now. It um, will give you guys the link um, in an email after this event, but it is going to close um, on October 31st on Halloween. We will be having a review process and then for our new cohort, we'll announce them on November 15th. Um, we will have a period of onboarding and training this winter, a couple meetings, and then we're hoping to have an official launch um, this April. Couple things that we're looking for um, is anybody affected or connected with NF that is 18 and up, so adults. Um, and this is, I think, a great opportunity for those that are interested in learning more about research, working more closely with researchers, you know, building that connection in the community. Um, and there's no experience required. We're actually looking for diverse group of perspectives. Um, that's how patient engagement, as I'm sure you guys can see, works best when you have um, patients that really can tell their story and we want to capture as many stories in this cohort as we can. So um, it comes to NF status or um, education location. We are interested in working with all of you guys. Um, and then very quickly, I just want to talk about why I'm talking to you guys. Um, NF2 folks is that um, you might imagine NF2 being a rare disease that when I mentioned before, how uh, patient engagement is really impactful and these diseases that need a lot of work to be done. That's absolutely true for NF2. Um, and there's a lot of um, I think need and um, yeah, there's a lot of need for um, you guys to lend your perspectives. So um, we're excited to work with y'all. And I'll just add here that um, 
patient engagement, this is I'm sure you see, and it can take a lot of different forms. And um, that's what we're going to be doing at our program. But there's lots of different ways this community has been engaged in patient engagement before, whether or not you've known it or not. And I'll just highlight a couple of those reasons. Um, a couple of those instances being diagnostic criteria update, which you guys will hear about next next month. I um, really had um, some great patient input in that project um, and making sure those researchers were thinking about all the things that matter to patients. Um, and then in 2019, we had a listening session with the FDA and I have a photo here of McKinnon Galloway speaking um, at that. And I'll just end that here that when it comes especially to engaging with research, showing up, asking questions, being leaders in your community, um, and have to accelerate I have to tell you guys about um, how important that is and um, whether you you know it or not, you, you, you've been in patient engagement, and uh, I want to thank you guys for being here. Um, it's a really exciting space, and you guys can see there's a really rich and incredible history here when it comes to patient engagement. So I know we have some questions to yeah. get to, and I will, yeah. Thank you, Emily. That was wonderful. It was great to see the kind of the whole history and the lead up into why this is important to us here at CTF and why we've been given the mandate to uh, relaunch this program and expand it in this way. Uh, we did have one question from the chat and Alana actually responded correctly, but I thought I would ask it aloud so that you could elaborate a little bit. Uh, but Hunter asked whether participating as a CTF engaged representative would um, bar or impact an individual's ability to participate in research or clinical trials themselves mm. at any point. No, absolutely. That's a great question. And like I said, um, you won't be required <laughs> to participate in research, but we know that many of you have, and that gives you the incredible experience and insight that I think we're looking for. And I'll find that um, you might be more interested in participating in research with this program, and you might um, have great things to share from your own experience. So we definitely um, encourage it if that's something that works for you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you can you can do both. You can do all of it. Um, and we absolutely encourage that. Um, we did get one more question. Uh, with Judy was asking for an idea of what the time commitment looks like, which is a really good question um, for for us to, to talk a little bit about. Yeah. So we haven't narrowed down anything yet. We um, the way it's working is kind of a match model. So we, we train you guys. The training itself is five hours asynchronous, you know, on your own time. And that's, you know, within that initial first few months. Um, we want to have regular programming with some kind of um, way for you guys to well, be social as well, you know, similar to the NF2 community that you guys hang out. Um, we're, I think we'll hammer down with our first cohort, you know, what their needs are for that and um, what you guys are willing to kind of give to this. Um, but as far as the projects themselves, you know, as they come along, you know, you'll be invited to participate, but it's not something, um, it's totally within your own time needs. And some of these, might be much more time intensive than others and whatever your you know capacity has that to um to give to that you know well yeah we're on our, we're all at that yeah no that's a great answer i'll add that um kind of what what emily is essentially saying is that it's a learning process for us as well and so yes. we will be leaning on our first pilot group to help us develop some of those um those the answers to some of those questions as well and to say um you guys are the the voices that matter here. So help us, you know, make this program um, everything that it that it can be. So um, yeah, that's great. Thank you, Emily. Um, okay, so we thought it might be nice in addition to um, the presentation and kind of getting this a fantastic community up to speed on um, what we're doing with CTF Engage. Um, I thought it would be nice also to hear from a clinician who has been just an incredible advocate in this space. Uh, I can speak from personal experience of having worked with Dr. Adanka for many years in different capacities that he's very committed to elevating the patient voice and the needs and desires of patients um, in research and clinical care. So I'm very happy to introduce uh, Dr. Oliver Adanka, um, who is the um, endowed professor and vice chair for the clinical operations um, in the Department of Otolaryngology, had a neck surgery at the, the Ohio State University. He also serves as the director of the Division of Otology, Neuroautology, and Cranial Base Surgery within that department, and in addition, also the director of Pediatric Otology and the Hearing Program at Nationwide Children's, which is one of the largest institutions of its kind in the country. Dr. Adanka has been the medical chair for the NF2 Accelerator Project since 2021 and has served also as a member of, this, of CTF's Clinical Care Advisory Board. Um, so I'm very happy to welcome Oliver. I'm going to spotlight uh, Emily and Oliver, and she's going to do a Q&A and give him the opportunity to talk a little bit about um, why this matters to him and why he's involved. So I'm going to stop talking and hand it over. 
Thanks, Kate. Um, and like I said, I have a few questions for Dr. Danka, but if you guys have questions um, for him on this topic as well, feel free to put those in the chat and we'll find them. Um, so Dr. Danka, just to give you um, just a quick recap, we've talked a little bit about um, the history of patient engagement, patients, the slow journey of getting patients more in the driver's seat when it comes to new, finding new therapies and new treatments. And as a physician yourself, um, I wanted to first talk a little bit about this peer involvement with this program, because I think those things are very well aligned. Um, so my first question is, when it comes to being involved with these NF2 meetups, what um, motivates you to be here every month? And what um, brings you, what, what, what brings you, um, what value do you bring from interacting with patients in this way? Yeah, thanks, uh, Emily, and uh, appreciate you having me. So I think just, um, I think, there are several reasons that really motivate me to be part of this, right? And I think that one is to um, be able to hear from from all people with NF2, right? And really people from um, parts of the countries that we wouldn't otherwise see, right? And, and that we can interact with. And then, of course, to um, communicate with uh, patients in a kind of informal fashion, right? And uh, understanding uh, more of the needs, right? And uh, as part of the previous meetings where we try to, you know, hone in on some of the communication needs, for example, the balance kind of things are really understanding the patients just beyond the MRI, really, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, understanding what what motivates uh, people, what what is the sort of daily quality of life um, uh, issue? Uh, what are the daily quality of life issues that are around, you know, and really it certainly expanded my scope of uh, being able to understand what's going on and then obviously tailor my recommendations based on these data. So I learned a lot actually from these meetups and um, I hope I've, uh, I've become a better doctor through these meetups, frankly, and uh, just to have these kind of direct patient interactions. And again, the, the informal, the informal uh, kind of, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, character, I think, uh, was really helping with that. Sure. It's different than talking to a patient yeah. in your clinic. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So my second question goes along with that. And it's, um, have, if you can think of something or to speak to how your interactions with NF2 have impacted your practice and your research. And I'll add here that, um, you know, options for treatment for NF2 folks have changed over the years. Um, and how you think the patient perspectives and views on those treatment options has kind of um, guided the field. Well, I think going back to um, that clinical care, right? I think um, trying to understand the patient's needs uh, better, right? Uh, really helps us make better recommendations. And again, that's beyond the MRI, right? So it's beyond what we see on the MRI and, you know, the hearing test and, but, you know, what really goes on, what are the, uh, what is the, what is the, what, what, what are the patient's goals really? Right. And I think um, that there's a big listening aspect, right. And understanding those. And um, in, in terms of research, I think uh, was your second part of your question. Um, I think, um, you know, these patient needs can often drive uh, research, right? And understanding that, yes, uh, surgery, and obviously I'm a surgeon, I'm still here in the operating room, but, it, you know, patients don't always want to have surgery, right? And uh, how um, how patients feel about surgery, what they're, um, you know, what, how they feel about these other options, you know, the risks and benefits. And when we talk about risks and benefits, how how they're really perceived by us may be very different than by patients, you know. And, mm -hmm. and I think there are quite a few uh, research projects that arise from this, right? And, and not just the clinical trials, but even smaller research projects that um, that really help uh, shape, uh, you know, our, our understanding as clinician and non-affected individual, uh, how can we really as as best as we can, you know, that take that other person's point of view. Absolutely. That's a great answer. Yeah. Um, um, in the last bit, I'm not going to ask you to predict the future, but um, when you think of the NF2 um, field and you can speak specifically to surgery, if you'd like, um, where do you see it moving in the future and how do you think the patient role will play um, a role in that? Yeah. Um, you know, we hope that the biologic treatments, right, will continue to evolve, right? Um, I think systemic, uh, you know, uh, long-term chemotherapy such as such as Avastin uh, 
and some of the newer compounds are really interesting. Um, my hope is really that gene therapy will will ultimately uh, really um, uh, be a breakthrough uh, that could really mm -hmm. help. So um, certainly, surgery may still have a role, and um, but uh, probably a smaller role uh, when um, we have really successful biologic treatments, right? And certainly what I've seen over the last, um, I would say 15 years, you know, is Avastin, for example, has really changed how we look at NF2, right? And, and treatments and the new biologics certainly um, have an effect of having the potential to even improve that further, right? So we have, uh, we have big hopes for, again, not just Avastin and similar drugs and compounds, um, but then off, obviously chemo, uh, the gene therapy, and there's several, you know, um, efforts underway. One is here in Columbus. So, uh, we, um, we certainly, you know, have high hopes. Yeah. And I'll just make a plug there. Gene therapy is when you hear from not just CTF and other rare disease groups uh -huh. that was at a rare disease conference last week, um, is the most important place for patient perspectives to be because yeah. new technologies always um, have their concerns and you know we want to make sure that that's something that um, the patients are really involved in so we'll definitely be working with that yeah. um, and i would say you know uh surgery is surgery right i mean it's we may be gotten a little better but it's really the skill of the surgeon i mean some of these tumors are very difficult to to take out and you know even for the most skilled surgeon right then it, there's a limit Right. So we need something that really gets us to the next level. All right. That was great. Thank you. Right. No problem. Uh, Kate, that was all of my questions for Dr. Dunka. I don't Perfect. know if we have any in the chat. Yeah, I don't think we, I don't see any questions in the chat, but I'll give everybody a few minutes um, if yeah. there's anything, but I also, I'm going to um, remove the spotlight so we can kind of see everybody here. Give me a minute. I'm, you know, getting it done. Um, but also if anybody wants to ask a question, you know, feel free to use the hand raise function. You can unmute and ask a question. That's absolutely fine. I'll give that a minute and then, okay. Well, that's great. All right. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Ajanka, for being here and sharing yeah, your perspective. I really you. appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. So I think we'll move now into talking a little bit about the polls. So thank you for participating, everybody. I really appreciate that. Um, and I'm just going to publish the results so we can kind of take a look at them. Okay, so is everybody able to see the poll results on your end? Emily, can you see it? Is it there? I can see it, yes. Okay, great, thank you. I'm looking at you. Um, excellent, okay, so we asked, uh, do you feel that NF scientists are studying topics that are important to you? And so, you know, it was definitely a split approach. We had um, at least, you know, one person who really felt like the answer was no. Some people said yes. We also had several not sure. Um, I'm curious if anybody's comfortable, you could put it in the chat or share out loud, um, especially with um, the not sure, it, it kind of the motivation behind that. And is it just a lack of feeling like you're not, you're not informed, like um, science is not doing a good job of keeping you informed of what's happening. Um, and so you think, well, I'm not sure what they're studying because they're not talking about it to patients, right? Um, mm -hmm. Or something else like that. So I'm gonna put that to the group. And if anybody is comfortable um, answering, I'd be, I'd love to hear from you. Okay, if we're quiet, that's okay too. Okay. All right, let me share our next poll. Okay. So um, Emily talked about the different types of engagement projects that we're planning for our CTF Engage um, program. And there's everything ranging from pharmaceutical companies um, who are always eagerly looking to work with patients. Um, a lot of times it's an advisory board capacity. They're looking for patients to share their stories, to um, give input on what matters most to them. Um, with researchers, uh, often there is there are opportunities to really help um, develop uh, protocols and so even building out survey questions and making sure that you know they're relevant to patients. Even the goal of the research: what should the researcher really be looking at? What are the questions that matter to the patient community? Um, speaking with the FDA, of course, and then also um, working with other patients to provide um, information, knowledge, and awareness. 
And actually along those lines, I saw Hunter, thank you, made a comment that he's not sure from the previous question was just sort of, he said a lack of due diligence. So that's um, that's one way to put it. But I also think that that goes both ways and that the research and science community has a responsibility to make information available in a way that the anybody in the patient community can understand and engage with. So thank you, Hunter. I'll just add to that, that Kate, that's a good point is that, you know, um, scientists know that it's their job to not only, you know, do research on behalf of this community, but to really explain it. And um, you know, it's challenging. It's really challenging to talk about, especially when you think about gene therapy, you know, there's a lot of um, groundwork that needs to be laid in terms of, you know, is this safe? Is this, um, how does gene therapy work? What are the risks? What are the benefits? You know, what should I be thinking about as a consumer of healthcare, but also as a member of this community? And um, I think those are all amazing questions that we want um, our patient representatives to be thinking about and be thinking about how to lay that groundwork that when a gene therapy comes available, we have a very informed patient community that's able to make a decision about that for themselves. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, we did get a question from Craig that says, are there any specific research programs that you have in mind right now that you want to pursue? Um, and the answer is definitely yes. So yeah. um, Emily, do you want to take a crack at it? And then Sure. So we work closely I, together. So <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, specific research programs. Um, well, so I'll say that we're eager to get. Um, we, as I said, we did one listening session with the FDA. We're eager to get more because um, we know that this should be a conversation we're having with the FDA and not just one time talking to them. Um, in particular, we've already been CTM has already been doing some of this. I would say in the past, when it comes, Kate mentioned how pharma is always very interested to talk to folks. Um, and we um, will con continue to have some of those projects we're working on right now. Um, should I, do you want to say anything else, Kate? Well, I was just going to also add that um, a project near and dear to my heart always is the NF registry um, and the way that patients are involved. So not only are patients, um, we want to encourage everyone to join the registry and we want to make sure we're doing a good job communicating um, the reason to do that, why it matters, how it could potentially be beneficial to you but, um, as an individual, but then also it's greater benefit. Um, but in addition to joining the registry, I have a small group of patients and clinicians who review requests that we receive. So when a, a scientist um, researcher wants data from the registry, we are able to share de-identified kind of high level um, aggregate data um, and to help them answer a research question they're asking, but they have to go through an application process that's reviewed by patients and clinicians on part of my uh, my data access committee. And so I rely heavily on input from the, uh, the patient community for the types of projects that we support with the NF registry. So that's that's one way where when it comes to CTF Engage, I'm always looking to expand um, that committee uh, with more um, people investing in, in kind of giving that feedback. Yeah, and, then and I'll add one more point um, that I don't think I did a good job of iterating is that, you know, this program is flexible and it's growing so that we certainly um, we'll be talking to researchers about um, bringing their projects to us, but also we want to hear from you guys about where you want to make an impact, um, and especially when it gets to that community component, or if there's something in particular, you know, patients, um, our cohort feels very strongly about that's something we want to work with them to um, create um, an impact in. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Just, just okay. to, um, so if I can go in, so I can get, hi, Craig from Melbourne in Australia. Hi. Um, uh, is there um, is there sort of a list of um, say projects that you have in mind that you would immediately recruit from say you know those of us who have NF two um, that you could immediately start um, putting people into and we can as a community start making a difference. That's a good question. Um, so as far as a list right now, we don't, it's, we're not really conceiving of it that way. Um, oh, that's really, there are some sure. projects we're eager to get you guys involved in early. Um, really, we're thinking this is to be a long-term commitment. Um, and that's not to say you can't participate in engagement projects and not be um, a patient representative, but this is something that, um, we, you know, as opportunities come up, which um, we are, I think I've been surprised how, how, how much they are that will be um, coming to you guys first. Yeah. Sure. So I know from, from my perspective, I mean, I, I have a science degree um, in biomedical sciences. I've, I've worked more in banking um, after that. 
Um, but I'm part of an F2 group in Australia, and there's well over 100 people on that. Uh, so I would be able to, um, you know, put a message out to the community here in Australia for people who may want to participate in certain programs, and maybe not not all of them, but certainly part of them. And um, you know, there's an active part within that group, and I would think that we can probably recruit people fairly quickly. Um, we all have a vested interest in trying to do what what we each can to um, either get a cure or find you know work on different cures or from all of the other different aspects that you've mentioned around engagement. So um, maybe we can you know happy to take this offline if if you've got time and have more of a chat and see what we can do. And yeah. um, I think that's also in terms of you know breaking down further what are the main areas of research um, that are continuing from, you know, the genomic side all the way through to the pharmaceutical side. And I, 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 because my background, I've been doing that anyway mm -hmm. um, across the world and which um, universities and which hospitals are the ones that I think are the, the leading uh, ones in, in the various different areas. So maybe we can, um, you know, let, line up a chat and um, see what we can do to you know, push it forward a bit as well. That's wonderful, Craig. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure Emily and I would be happy to meet with you and talk a little bit more. And you bring up a great point, which just came to our attention recently that I can just chat just for a moment about, which is that um, as we were developing the program, um, there are certain elements of, of patient engagement that are kind of uh, without borders, right? There's certain ways that patients are supporting and interacting with researchers and scientists that are um, going to look kind of the same and and no matter where you are. And there's also ways that um, interacting, it doesn't require to be physically present in a room, et cetera, especially in this day and age of Zoom and all this great technology we have. Um, and then there are some elements where it's sort of, it's our mandate, you know, eventually when, as we continue in this space to start understanding the place, things that are different, depending on what country you're in, you know, the FDA is a, U, a US, you know, body, right? And then Europe has the EMA and, right? And so kind of, being able to, but CTF is a global organization. And so it's part of our mandate to, to start really learning about, you know, things worldwide. So I love, I love that you're here and that you mentioned that I would definitely be happy to connect. Yeah, there. there are, um, I, I was uh, chairman of a, um, of an immunology company as well. And there are definitely programs here in Australia that are FDA compliant um, in, in terms of the research that's done. So um, just because we are in Australia, we we can still fall into line with all of those studies as well. So that's wonderful. Yeah, we should definitely talk. This is great. I love this community. Um, I'll just quick mention. I love. Thank you, Sarah, for your plug for the registry. I really appreciate that. I'm glad to hear it's been a good experience for you to participate in. Um, okay, let me just share the results of our last poll. So we had asked, you know, essentially just a statement of, I believe I can make a difference in advancing NF research. Uh, and again, we're kind of split between yes and I'm not sure, which is, that's about right, I think, right? We have probably some folks who are, you know, yes, absolutely, I understand what's happening in a lot of these spaces, or I've already participated to some, you know, degree. Um, and then we have probably, you know, many others who are, um, I know we even had a couple of comments. I love Jake's comment about, you know, I go see Dr. S Dr. Plotkin and, and I say, am I winning? And if he says yes, I, you know, I know it's a good day and I love that. And there's nothing, that's a great way to approach. Um, it's a very unique journey for each patient to decide when and how they're going to engage in the many opportunities that may be presented. So um, I think that's great. I'll actually add one more thing there that I didn't get to is um, patient engagement can take many forms, as I'm sure you can see. And um, I think it, it's really wonderful um, that it is that way because um, we as people, you know, all have different preferences. And I know for me, like I would love to sit down and chat with a researcher, you know, over a Zoom call maybe, but I wouldn't love standing up in front of, you know, 15, 20 people at the FDA and um, sharing something that's a little, you know, a little bit more public. So uh, that's all to say that there's, I think, a variety of niches when it comes to skill sets and interests, and um, we're interested in all of it. And so that's something that we'll be um, interested to see our patient representatives, you know, what they, how they would like to engage, because it's not just an example of, um, of where, with what topic, but really in what ways do you feel like you can make an impact? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Emily. Um, 
so we did have a couple of more questions. I'm going to put one in the chat um, and, and then I'll also, you know, say it. Um, but just for discussion, again, if anyone's comfortable speaking and there's never pressure for that, um, but as active members of the NF2 community, as evidenced by your presence here tonight, what benefits do you see in working with NF scientists or doctors in really any of the capacities that we've talked about tonight? Um, and certainly if you have any personal experience in, in doing anything along those lines, feel free to chime in or to share that. Um, we'd love to, to hear from you again in the chat or feel free to unmute and, uh, and share. All right. And then I'm going to put one more question. I'm going to put them both in there. Ah, improvements of care. Yes. Let me put this other question in here, but let me comment on what Lauren had shared. Um, and so, yeah, Lauren said, if we're going to be working with scientists and researchers, we really want care to improve. Um, Lauren, I don't want to put any pressure on you, but if you are uh, comfortable expanding on that comment, either aloud or in the chat, I'd love to know um, what that what that would look like for you um, to have improved care. Um, sure. I, you know, speak to my daughter's doctor frequently about just simple things like um, how MRI reports are written. And I'm always told that, you know, they're trying to develop protocols and put things in place and have like only one person reading certain reports. So in terms of doctors on that end, and um, also, you know, if like my daughter participated in one of the trials, just having the information and then knowing what the response was to that and being able to ask questions. So just overall improvement of care. That's great. Thank you so much, Lauren. I see David has raised his hand. David, if, David, if you want to unmute and share. Oh, maybe it was an accident. No, I'm good. Sorry about that. That's okay. It just took me a while to get back to my phone. <laughs> I just got done work at like six o'clock. Um, okay. So I don't have NF2, I have schwannomatosis. Mm -hmm. But um, but so far, what I've done um, with my schwannomatosis, um, after I met Dr. Pock and back in 2010, they had a symposium. And it was pretty cool because I got to learn a lot of stuff at the symposium. And I actually got to go into the labs and see how they use fruit flies to try to figure out, you know, really not necessarily they know the gene obviously that causes the the mutation but um why the tumors grow mm -hmm. so um i know when i had some wide brain surgery in 2017 um and had a schwannoma removed and my doctor pretty much saved my life down here in um, south carolina at musc and he got the whole tumor which was great um and then afterwards i had some little tumors i wanted to get out but i actually made arrangements for the tumors to get um, shipped up to Mass General from MUSC. The pathologist down there went and did that for me. So I donated my tissue, my tumor tissue, so the research can, you know, they can research it. So, um, yeah. I, I mean, I love that I could do that kind of stuff to help out. Mm -hmm. And um, my son, he's 16. I don't think that he has it, but if he does, you know, show some signs down the road and we do genetic testing because my genetic testing came back um with mosaicism it didn't mm -hmm. come up right away mm -hmm. um they had to test the tumor tissue but i want to stay on top of it because if something should come up with him you know because it's so genetic but um but yeah mm -hmm. i love being involved um and dr pock is pretty awesome that's wonderful thank you david and yeah that's a great example of um just the the commitment from especially I think I think you see in rare disease communities um, to um, participating and and to trying to and wanting to stay engaged in ways that they can move science and move research forward. So thank you for sharing that, David. Okay, um, I don't think I don't see any more questions in the chat, um, and so I think we'll um, I'll do some kind of closing housekeeping. Um, Emily put her direct email in the chat, um, and then I'm also just going to put in the. Um, there's an NF2. Oh, that's not right, guys. I'm so sorry. I shouldn't talk and type at the same time. There's an NF2 inbox. 
um, that you can also email. If you have any comments or questions about tonight, if you have ideas for future topics, we've been doing these meetups for um, about two and a half years now. And Emily and I are, uh, and Alana, who's also here with us tonight, um, are taking on the kind of moving forward and planning them alongside Dr. Adunka with other, um, you know, support as well. And so we are eager to hear from you if there are topics we haven't covered before, or maybe talked about a long time ago, and there's something that you'd like to hear again, um, or an update on, please do, um, please do share. Um, you can send us an email and we're happy to hear from you. Um, if you are interested in becoming a patient representative, or if you even just want more information, um, you can, um, I think Emily put the link in the chat for us and um, visit the right perfect. And I'll also be sending this out after email, so I don't feel like you need to grab this. Yes. Right now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There'll there'll be an email that comes out to everyone who registered, so that information will come to you um, for how you can get more information about becoming a patient representative. Um, and then if you indicated when you registered tonight that you want more information about the NF2 Accelerator Program, um, a member of staff will be reaching out to you about that as well. Um, our next meetup, I don't have a date yet. I'm waiting for our speaker to confirm, but it should be late November to early December. And we're going to be talking about those diagnostic updates and some of the naming changes that um, that happened over the last year. Um, and we'll have, um, I believe it's going to be with Dr. Caleb Yohe, who's a fabulous NF clinician out of um, NYU uh, and was a, a key member of the group that wrote the paper on the, the changes to the diagnostic um, criteria. So he'll be presenting. So please be looking for that information coming soon. Um, and then, as I said, if you have any suggestions for topics, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, we want to hear from you. So thank you for joining us, everyone, tonight. I really appreciate it um, and have a great night.